All right, Professor, just to jump into the question. So, you know, your research focuses on the aggregate level. On the whole, our lives have been made so much easier by larger companies like Apple, Amazon, Google. But do these companies have too much market power? Well, in our research, we find that they do, that basically across different measures that we use to, uh, to try and calculate what the market power is, we find that these uh, companies exert too much market power, they're basically too big in their market and they are setting prices that are too high. Now, you might think a price for, say, Google, we get everything for free, even that price is too high and the reason is because they, at a zero price, should really be paying you because they're using your data. Uh, uh, to uh, basically sell that good for you. Awesome. Thank you for that response. So the main finding from your research is that there's a cross-industry trend of the concentration of market power in the hands of a few companies. What does this mean for you and me, for the average consumer? Well, you started off with, with like the big tech, Amazon, Google, Apple, but this is something we find that is much more broad in the economy. So this happens in textiles, this happens in beers, this happens in publishing, this happens in a lot of different sectors. And what it means is that we basically, as the average consumer, we're paying too much for uh, what we're consuming. For example, your beer, the price of beer has gone up uh, disproportionately because Again, there's a few very large dominant firms in the beer market who are responsible for the global supply of the beers and that means they therefore that we pay too much for it. And for the, how is this significant to the average worker? How is it different and how is it significant for them? Now, that's an excellent question. So what you know, the obvious thing is, of course, when you talk about market power in the goods market, that, that firms set too high prices. But what does that mean for the worker? And what we find in the, in the research is that effectively what it does is there's enough of these dominant firms, there's enough of these firms that are large enough. And what they're doing is that they are setting prices that are too high. That's fine. We've already talked about that. But what this implies is that they're actually producing too little. Why? Because at higher prices, customers buy less. And as you buy less, that also means that you have to produce less. And if there's less production, there's less demand for labor, and that dampens the demand for, uh, sorry, that dampens the wages. And as a result, we see, in fact, that wages are lower than what they would be if there was no, not so much market power. And we see that these effects are actually quite sizable, that the, the, the wage depression is somewhere between 15 and 20%. All right. So the next segment of the interview is going to be focusing on the applications of what you found and what you mentioned in your paper as well as the profit paradox. So we learned that the rising market share and markups cause a reallocation towards larger firms and a declining labor share. So as economies are slowly returning to normality, of what we can call normality, we're seeing labor shortages and wage increases in many sectors. Do you think this will reverse the decline of labor share we've seen so far? Well, I mean, remember we are looking at a very long duration time uh, period we've been looking since 1980 so it's, it's been four decades and you know if, if we had done this study in 2008 we would have been talking also about the impact that for example the great recession would have had the great recession from 2008 or if we would have talked about this a couple of years afterwards and clearly these things are important and and, and you know these great recession or now the, the pandemic distort the whole economy and also affect market power in many different ways. But I wouldn't jump to a quick conclusion and say, oh, now we have shortages due, by the way, due to the, the, the supply chain uh, kind of uh, be, be, being distorted because of the pandemic, that this now means that all oh, this whole issue is now changed. This is a temporary thing. And, you know, we have to see how long this will last and maybe it can turn into permanent thing. But at the moment, this is you know, something that's going on on top of what we're seeing in terms of this long run trend that uh, is affecting businesses and, and how much competition there is in the market. So I, I would make a distinction between some short term changes, more cyclical, as we call them, versus these very long term changes that we're looking at uh, with this market. power. So you mentioned that one of the solutions to this sick economy, as you called it, is to foster competition. So would there be any regulation which fosters this competition? And what would it deal with? Property rights, shortages on patents, maybe improving the supply of human capital? 
how, how will it work? I mean, I think the solution to the problem is indeed more competition. I mean, we're seeing that there's this, this lack of competition because firms are dominant and large. And, and, you know, the question is why they're so dominant and large? Because they use new technologies to basically keep competitors out. And the reason for that is because these new technologies have large scale economies. These new technologies have what we call network effects. And this favors large firms. And we want them to be large. We want a network to be large just in the same way that we want, you know, eBay as a platform, we want this to be large because this is what makes this market efficient. But we have to keep in mind that even if you want the platform and the network to be large, that we have to foster competition on this network. And this requires some form of separating the operators on the network from the network itself. And at the moment, this is joined together. Think of this as, you know, and building train lines and you'd say at the moment, let me have two train uh, companies, railway companies compete against each other by putting drawing lines next to each other. I think it's much easier to say, let's have a network of train lines, okay, one between each city, but let's have different companies compete on it, okay, compete on this network. And this idea is an idea that's coming from, well, far back, it's, it's sometimes called interoperability. And interoperability is, is, a, is an idea that comes from the, the founding fathers of, of the internet. And they said, we really on this network that the internet is, we need there to be access to many different operators. For example, an email address is accessible. I can send you an email from a provider here locally to uh, your UCL email address. And, and we are going across different companies, different providers, but the interoperability setup that's really baked in, built in, in the internet is that you know we have to have this access this notion of interoperability means that technology should be such that different providers have to be able to operate in different environments and these environments mean platforms they mean networks they mean all these large-scale aspects of the economy that give us the scale advantage, but we do want to make sure that there is competition on there. Because if there's no competition on there, this happens, for example, with eBay. eBay can charge any buyer or seller on its auction platform 7, 8, or 9% as a commission because they don't have competition from other providers. Why is there no competition? Because, well, eBay owns the platform and eBay operates on the platform. And if you would have more operators competing on this platform, that would generate more competition. But now that requires regulation. That requires that the antitrust authority, for example, steps in and says, well, we want to change the terms of doing business here. And, and, and one good example of that is telecom in Europe compared to telecom in the United States. For example, my phone plan in the United States is with AT&T and my phone plan here in Europe is with Movistar. Now, technology is identical. The only difference is that the regulator in Europe has imposed interoperability and says that if a provider, say from Poland, wants to be oper uh, uh, operating in, in Holland, what they can do is they can just go to one of the existing providers who has a network, their cell towers, and this Polish provider can just plug in their devices. They don't have to invest in building this very expensive network of cell towers. What that means is that it's easy for competitors coming into this market. You will see many more competitors and the way this works is they're going to lower prices. And in Europe, you have about 100 plus uh, mobile phone providers. Prices are about half or less than half than what they are in the United States because the United States, AT&T, for example, does not have to allow any competitor on its uh, cell towers. And I think these simple pieces of regulation can really improve the, the, the competition in each market and therefore make everyone better. So it's kind of like making it easier for a competitive state in the market and to, to have them share the pie in a way. Then they give them the knife and the fork which allows them to share the pie in a way. It, it, exactly. I mean, basically you want to lower the barriers of entry. But at the same time, because you know, new technologies are such that there are these scale effects. We want scale. Scale is good. We don't want to chop up these firms per se. What we want to do is we want to maintain the scale because that's the technological advantage 
you know, of having large uh, uh, markets or large platforms, for example. But we have to lower with this interoperability as a principle, the barriers of entry and to make it easier to enter into this market. I always say, you know, that the, 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 the new technology, this fast technological change that we see now in this digital age is one that has basically a kind of an aspect in the movie of the hero and the villain. It's the hero because it allows us new technologies, it's innovation, this creates progress. And this is exactly what we want. But at the same time, this new technology is the villain because if you go back to the example of eBay, they use the network effects, the scale effects to keep competitors out. Yahoo Auctions for many years has tried to come into this auction market, online auction market, and they've never managed to do that. They only got a very small share of this market precisely because you know, the value of this platform isn't being big. Now, if a regulator would say eBay, in your pricing, you have to allow also Yahoo auctions on your network at a cost, at a compensation. And then what you would see is that there would be much more competition in terms of the fees that eBay and Yahoo would be able to charge to users. It wouldn't be seven, eight or 9%. It would probably be more like, be more like half a percent of each of the transactions. And that's going to be, of course, more competition. And it's going to be in the interest of the, uh, the customers. So just a few questions about how we've seen some of the trends in your paper in recent events. I don't think any discussion these days is complete without a reference to COVID. So in your research, you compared Pfizer's profit payroll, which was 41% in 1980 and 210% in 2021. I think we discussed you know, the way the pandemic might affect this market power in the short term earlier in this interview. But do you think that the pandemic has reinforced the concentration of market power? and essentially cemented the place. Yes, we, we have looked at what happened, what the impact was of, of uh, the pandemic on um, markets and on, on, on profit rates. And one of the things that we find is, of course, is that the initial moment that the pandemic hit in March 2020, we saw a negative effect on the results of the firms. But then within the shortest time, there's been a recuperation of the profitability of these firms. And in fact, to a larger extent, in, in, in a sense, stronger than it was before. And it's sufficient to look at what happened to the, the, the stock market because the stock market had recuperated by the summer of 2020. That's a sign that the profitability was back because the stock, stock market reflects what profits uh, uh, are in firms. And I think our way of thinking of this is that, you know, a, a, a pandemic, a crisis like the pandemic is one other form, and this may sound strange, but it's another form of fast technological change because we've started doing things differently. As customers and as firms, we now, you know, you and I are on a Zoom call. We didn't do that before the pandemic. I mean, some of us did it maybe once or twice, but it was just something fairly rare. And now we do it all day long. And there's many different aspects of the economy that have changed which um, is a way of thinking of fast technological change. You'll see in response, for example, to the, to the disruptions in the supply chain, that there's going to be innovations there too. And all these innovations, fast technological change, typically are again the hero and the villain. They're good because we can do things better, more efficiently. We can do it in a way that is actually bringing value to the economy. But at the same time, the firms that are engaging in it are going to use that same technological change as a way to keep competitors out. And this is the villain part. And I think the pandemic is telling us that this is something that's going on fast now too. So it's providing an opportunity for change to happen, for people to emerge as winners or losers then. It's that's an opportunity. Right. It's a wave. Yeah. So I think earlier this month, um, Facebook... WhatsApp, Instagram were all unavailable for about, I think it was 17 hours. And now we know that Facebook has essentially conquered the media market. But do you think that episodes like this, and there might be others to come in the future, do you think they will disillusion people to their reach or does it not matter because their position is already strong enough in this network economy? I think this is a great question. I do not know the answer to that, but I can, I can say this. I, can, I think that, you know, this 17 hour uh, uh, lack of availability of, of what has become, you know, like really an essential service. Companies were losing business and advertising revenue because the customers were not online. And 
we users were affected because we, you know, we were about to meet with someone, wanted to send a WhatsApp message and it didn't come through. And so this is telling us that these companies have become so important and so crucial in the way we are doing things in society that they have become like, like, you know, too big to fail. There's this notion from banking, and this is something that uh, um, our colleague uh, uh, Thomas Filippo from NYU has pointed out. Many of these firms, these tech firms, they really want to become like some of these banks, too big to fail. And if things go wrong, then, you know, the government is going to be concerned because these too big to fail companies now really should be protected even more. Okay. And I think that rather than treating them as too big to fail and say, oh, if these companies, for whatever reason, cannot uh, uh, functionally uh, or, or operate in, in a normal way, we should protect them. We should say, well, maybe if we have more competitors, that would be a way to ensure that the service is there because it was only in, in Facebook's headquarters where there was a problem. So if we had you know, competing providers, we wouldn't have had that, uh, that problem. And I, I think that, that this, this notion of too big to fail is something that we should definitely be concerned about. Did you have a eureka moment at any given point in time when you were formulating your key finding? Just, just a moment where you were like, oh, wow, this just makes sense. I mean, there was, a, there was a, first a moment when we saw the data, which was more like a, 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 this can't be a eureka moment. This must be wrong. When we saw the first results, I mean, where we saw these uh, markups that we were measuring and then we were plotting this in this, this in fact, I, I showed this result to, to, uh, to Jan the Looker and he said, you know, you must have done something wrong. And so then he did it, got the same results. So, so that, that was a rather kind of a moment of, of severe doubt and, and, and which is part of, of any, any academic uh, uh, exercise. I think the Eureka moment probably came when, um, when we were linking this to a lot of other long-term trends that we have been uh, observing. So, you know, in, in the economy since the 1980s, we've seen that uh, wages have stagnated. We've seen that inequality has increased. We've seen that there was a, a decline in business dynamism. So firms were turning over their workers slower. Promotions had slowed down. That the number of startups, the fraction of startups had declined. And we knew these facts were there. But the Eureka moment came when we could link them to the role of market power that could be a, a, an explanation for each of these developments. And I think that was kind of the economic insight that uh, uh, was probably the most surprising or the most uh, uh, gratifying eventually. So just to wrap up, Professor, my last question would be, so my generation is forecasted to be one which is less well-off than our parents. And we're going to be the losers of the sickle economy, which you mentioned in your project syndicate article. Do you have any word of advice for young academics and young economists who are going to navigate the economy in the coming years? So first of all, I, I sadly have to agree that I think your generation is the one that's going to be most affected in a not positive way. I think there's a silver lining uh, on this cloud, which is that there's a market difference between different people in terms of education and in terms of, of training, uh, how they fare. The wage stagnation, for example, that we see is mainly for people who are in production or service work, not people who do, let's call it higher uh, uh, productivity work, higher kind of more sophisticated uh, technology work. And so, you know, computer programmers, uh, and I would say in general academics or economists more broadly, they are probably on the lucky end of this that they benefit uh, in, 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 to some extent. So, so you know, it, it depends. But if, if you have someone in your neighborhood, you, or, or you know, there's definitely going to be someone in your neighborhood who's, who's not going to be uh, as well off, and it's going to be actually be worse off of them than their parents. It's one of the implications is the inequality that we see as, in, as a result of uh, the, the, the market dominance, and this is something that we have to to keep keep in mind. I mean. It, Advice, keep training, keep studying, keep uh, uh, specializing. You know, you, you, talk, you talked about specialization, but, but it, it's, it's definitely the case that, that, you know, there's going to be pressure on all kinds of jobs in the, uh, in the mid to long term. 
And this pressure is also going to start to, you know, we get more and more of this superstar effect and the, you know, the, the, the win it takes all even for workers, not for firms. And so, you know, it's impossible for us all to be superstars. But, you know, let's uh, uh, try and at least be part and be on that bandwagon because if, if the type of job you're doing is one as a production or a service worker, then the, 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 the things don't look good. I mean, I do think that there is hope. And if we really want to do something as societies that we, I think, should, should try and think of ways in which we can uh, break these dominant positions of these large firms and break these monopolies in, 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 in ways that we talked about before through introducing and fostering more competition into the market. And I think that's going to have positive effects. The sick economy is going to be healthy again if we can uh, achieve that. Well, I, I think all of us can only hope it's... Who knows what the future will hold? Well, thank Professor, thank you so much for answering all of our questions. It's been it's been wonderful st- talking to you, and I think uh, it's been I guess, I guess there's just so much behind this, and there's so much more to come. But it's been wonderful to, to get an understanding of what's happening in the world so far.